All right. Um, welcome to our panel, Animal Influencers as a Way Out of Climate Fatigue. Repeated predictions of disappearing coastlines and species extinction have resulted in climate change fatigue. We are collectively over it. <laughs> <laughs> and how do we keep the conversation going without create, uh, and create change without burning out? Animal influencers. Today, we are very fortunate to have a star lineup of animal influencers. Austin Icon, Marlene Tato. Without him, you'll, you'll be able to see the bats under the Congress Bridge. And he educates the world through Marlene Tato's bat conservation. Warren Carlyle, he runs the largest octopus fan club. You can see all these octopus lining up here. <laughs> and Virginia, artist Virginia Montgomery, who creates dynamic visual art with Luna Moth. There are animal influencers around us, all around us, that inspire wonder and awe. And when we appreciate the natural world, we are more likely to protect it. And first, each of us will have a short introduction uh, to give you some context. And we'll start with Marlene Tato. Good afternoon. I'm delighted to have this opportunity to present some of the world's most fascinating and important, yet frequently misunderstood and persecuted animals. I've studied bats for more than 60 years, in fact, founded an organization, Merlin Tuttle's Bat Conservation, exclusively to educate people about bats. Bats are an extremely diverse group that are found virtually everywhere worldwide. And there isn't a single human on this planet that hasn't in some way been positively impacted by bats. They're incredibly diverse, coming from giants with nearly six foot wingspans to tiny bats the size of bumblebees. They can be as cute as any panda, as strange as any dinosaur. And with all that, it's my opinion that although they've long been neglected as animal influencers, bats are indeed animals that have ideal potential as animal influencers, given their wide distribution, their diversity, their relevance to human best interests, and much more. When I'm told that someone hates bats, I have a simple response. I don't try to argue with them. I just start asking them questions clearly aimed at how can I solve whatever the problem was that caused you to hate bats? <laughs> and people are shocked, you know, when you treat them that way. They expect you to get mad and come back at them for uh, uh, maligning your animals or not loving them. But what I found is that by being sensitive to human needs first and then recruiting them to join you in helping animal needs, you can get almost miraculous achievement. I've had countless people go from hating bats and killing bats to loving bats and protecting bats all in a course of minutes. I'd like to think that some of my positive approaches to a group that when I began were so ill thought of that most people thought they were totally hopelessly impossible to conserve, uh, if I could achieve what I have for bats using these strictly positive win friends, not battles approaches, there must be hope for other challenging areas if only we get a little more positive in how we deal with people. Thank you. And, and Merlin's kind of humble. Um, he is like an Austin icon. Like, like he, he mentioned, the bats would not exist under Congress Bridge had he not stepped in and educated. So can we get another round of applause? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it brings over, I think, like over $10 million a year just in tourism and all this stuff. So it's, yeah. So anyways, about me. Um, I, if you want me to grab it, I can. Just because I have. Can you just press the middle one? Uh, this one? 
Cool. So great. So um, I am Octonation, the largest octopus fan club. Um, just to give you a little bit uh, about me, is that's me over there. Um, uh, it's kind of like when I first discovered the octopus. I was seven years old, and I went to an aquarium. I'm ADHD, um, very neurodivergent, and uh, I remember we were walking in a single file line, and I was just like, this does not work for me. And so I, I went to the back of the line and just dropped off and took my own aquarium tour and uh, found myself in front of an octopus exhibit. And I remember seeing the octopus and just, for whatever reason, I was just like, this is the weirdest thing I've ever seen in my life. Um, and so naturally, I wanted to go to the library and make flashcards, because that was my thing. Uh, but there were no books uh, about the octopus. And I was like, this is strange. So I went to a bigger public library. There were no books. And I said, how could this animal not have any books? It doesn't make any sense. Um, I found myself in, you know, uh, later on working as a studio manager for a celebrity fashion photographer. And while it was really cool, I was working with influencers, celebrities, working with big brands, you know, uh, and influencers. It just didn't really do anything for me. I thought, what if we could take everything in this industry as far as like fashion? And I was like, all they're doing is reverse engineering the relevancy of cloth. What if I did it with something more meaningful, like the octopus? Um, so I uh, reached out to Cy Montgomery, who wrote the book The Soul of an Octopus, and she, I told her I want to carry her torch online, and uh, and she said, go get it. And so that was all the uh, the you know confidence that I needed. I have no background in marine biology whatsoever. I'm just kind of like a freak. So I just, I just did it. Um, and so this is kind of like the, the way that I educate, is the, the superheroes of the sea, they, there's over 300 species, and they live in every ocean, they're along every coastline. Um, like you see the coconut octopus here, you know, they have transforming armor, um, they can assemble coconut shells. Um, none of these videos work, so I'm just going to skip through them. But I was really surprised when I created Octonation. We're the first ever comprehensive field guide of octopus species online ever. Um, and it was just really surprising to me that an animal that's been on this planet since before dinosaurs didn't have these resources created. So I was like, okay, I guess I'll create it. So I connected with the scientist and we knocked it out. Um, so these are what the profiles look like. Very easy to understand um, and just really approachable. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen this octopus before. Um, it's kind of like the Beyonce of octopuses. Um, the blanket octopus, and the only females look like this. The males are the size of like uh, an acorn. Um, but we, uh, we do something, we do fanat fanatical community building. We have uh, thousands of our members have tattoos, um, and some of them are our logo. Some of them are, you know, our stickers and things like that. We have an amazing creative director. Um, was asked to be a part of the Facebook Community Accelerator and got some funding. Uh, Facebook has promoted us a lot. We're kind of like their poster child, or poster octopus. Um, and we do virtual octopus encounters, so we bring octopuses to, uh, uh, to kids uh, wherever they're at. Uh, I've done that all over the world now. I just kind of did my own thing. Um, and just uh, in the fashion industry, what you, what you know is it's like, what's the next campaign? What's the next campaign? And so with the octopus, I basically did that. I've connected with uh, underwater photographers, influencers, celebrities. Um, I mean, you name it. I've, I've done collaborations with them. And then I got into the classroom. Um, and we do uh, Octopus Superhero Academy in a lot of different um, school districts and things like that. And that's kind of what it looks like. Um, our, my creative director is a genius. Um, I saw him on, on Instagram Live one, one day, and he had like five people watching him. And I was just like, this guy needs to be famous. And so we, we worked with him. Andrew Huberman is a huge fan of octopus and cuttlefish. I don't know if anybody knows that here. Um, but we can't lose with Andrew Huberman's support. Um, and then, uh, so we dominate online. We want to be the gold standard for octopus information because nobody's doing it. And so I figured, why not me? Um, kind of what we have working on next is uh, National Geographic. Um, we're working with them on a project. We're launching the first ever book about octopus species, <laughs> just octopuses in general. It's just so strange to me like that, that I had to be the first one to, to launch this book, but I guess you know, here we are doing it. And uh, this past year, we reached over half a billion people with our um, education. And so um, I'm ADHD, so I, I thought I could get that done in two minutes, but uh, here we are, and that's me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hi everyone, I'm Virginia L. Montgomery. I am a visual artist and I am based here in Austin, Texas. 
So I'm a metaphysical multimedia video artist that raises Luna Moths, films Luna Moths, makes artwork about Luna Moths, and then inserts my Luna Moth artwork into the art world. So my task is to try to expose Luna Moths and other winged beauties to these very kind of esoteric, academic-oriented fine art spaces. If you are an Austin native, you might have seen some of my work last year at the Contemporary Austin. This was on display. This is a video I made called O oh Luna. So I make these surreal short videos that are kind of a combination of like a witchy science experiment and a beautiful dream sequence. So in this video, there's actually a newly hatched little Luna Moth that's climbing on this um, Luna Moth obstacle course that I created filled with little bells. And so as the Luna Moth is climbing around, um, it creates a nice little sound score. Let's see, we'll see if I can get this play one more time. And so this is just a short video excerpt of my work. You can see my work online. Um, I actually currently have three works on display at the Blanton Museum right now. And if you happen to be in London, I'm going to have some works on display at the Tate Modern at the end of March. So, you know, it's no small feat to get Luna Moths and bugs, which most people think are creepy, into these high art spaces. But that's me, I'm a video artist. And um, the sound's not coming through, but if anyone wants to watch this video, I make all of my work publicly available on Vimeo in addition to going to art spaces. Oh, you can start to hear the soundtrack coming through. So I'm a sound designer. I make field recordings of the natural world. Those little bells are actually being played by Luna Moths. So I co-create artwork with Luna Moths to try to find a way for there to be a mutual agency in the production of my work. And so this clip right now actually shows a Luna Moth scale DSLR camera that I created for her. Because my whole thought, you know, if you're trying to break down this like psychoanalytic dynamic between object and subject, I'm like, why do I always have to be behind the lens? Maybe she wants to be behind the lens. So I, I created a camera for her. <laughs> so um, yeah, this work of Luna. So completely jumping ship. I also have a background in marketing, which is part of my own expertise I can bring here to the panel. I'm one of the people that does these things, which you guys may have seen at events like South by Southwest before. Yeah. Woo, I'm that person, now you know who I am. And so this is my day job. And so I travel around the world, I go to different TED Talks, different um, brainstorming meetings, I listen to what people are saying, and then really, really fast, I synthesize that information, and in real time, without knowing what people are gonna say, I make these big visual notes. Yeah, and so um, a lot of the work that I do is with all kinds of different Fortune 500 groups, spanning healthcare, tech, uh, you know, biotech, sometimes it's ecology groups, sometimes it's the United Nations, sometimes it's Dan and Yogurt. Um, that's an example of a work that I did with a group called Vive Healthcare that works with women that have HIV. So between my two practices, I have Luna Moths, and then I have uh, large visual notes, but they both kind of are whoop, linked together through systems of visual communication. So that's what I can bring to the table here, is that I am really honed in on like what are symbols that will help your brand or help you um, subvert the art world. Awesome. Yeah. Oh, oh, I get my own. <laughs> well, uh, speaking of co-creation, <laughs> um, I'm an artist, Jia Baoli, um, artist, designer, creative technologist. I co-create with non-human species to try to shift people's perspective from the egocentric to ecocentric, where humans are intertwined with other species instead of being on top of the pyramid. Um, I co-create with the Hawaiian bobtail squid. Well, I hung out in the science lab in Hawaii who studied the microbiome in the bobtail squid. Um, I noticed they live in this boring white tanks all day long, so I wonder if I could play a, uh, make a playground for them to make their environment more interesting. So I collect the sand from uh, the white sand and black sand from Hawaii Islands and make them into the shape of countries, here is China and US. And then uh, the squid live in there for one month, carrying the sand around, kind of reshaped the, de the definition of uh, borderlines and countries. Um, 
and he used these cute little tentacles to push <laughs> the sand on their body as a camouflage. <laughs> and you can see that over the one month that uh, she, he reshaped the, this uh, white and black and uh, where the delineation of the uh, country borders. And this is after a month that he's like sitting in the middle of the black, have uh, white and black on top, and then surrounded by white and black, but feeling perfectly camouflaged. Mm. <laughs> and that's the before and after. And like for um, millions of years that, or, or hundreds of thousands of years that this um, human-made borders in the eyes of the squid is drawn on their own terms. Um, I, this Sulu scene is about um, thinking about a non-anthropocentric world where we imagine that octopus is becoming the next upcoming species um, and we are trying to adapt and embody and practice the becoming of octopus um, through uh, practicing um, distributed intelligence and try to shift our perception from a very visual dominated field to a more tactile feeling. Um, I'm also, uh, some up, more upcoming works, I'm giving my, the agency of my health to the mouse, and they are becoming my health coach. And also I'm co-creating with the bats to make music t together with and for them. Um, and I'm also writing a books about, um, among other, with other uh, artists uh, who work with animals, like animals as the builders of artworks and artists create from the distinct behavior of the animals. Um, I'm also a professor here at UT Austin. I run a lab called okay. Ecocentric Future Lab. Um, and I also have a work currently showing at the XR experience uh, called Once a Glacier, and it's about glaciers. Um, yeah, with that, let's start. Where's your show? It's in the XR experience. It's in Fairmount. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's establish context. When you hear the word influencers, what does it mean to you? Just shout out what it means to you. Public TikTok, opinion. Instagram, yes? Public opinion. Public opinion, yeah. <laughs> Yoga. <laughs> Sponsored engagement. Okay. Wow. Well. Mm, building communities, yeah. Then let's get into the animal influencers. Um, can you discuss how animal influencers on social media uh, contribute to raising awareness about environmental issues, and particularly in contrast to the coverage of climate fatigue? Yeah, so I'll start. Um, I just wanted to kind of show you this. We, uh, like I said, this past year, we had over half a billion views like on our social media. And um, we do things a little bit differently with Octonation. We inspire wonder of the ocean by educating the world about octopuses, not an animal rights organization, not we don't talk about pollution or all of that. We feel like there's enough work to be done in the ocean literacy space um, that, I mean, we really need to stay in that space uh, and not be overly judgmental for you know, anything. And so this is just an example of something that I do is on one side, I'll have an octopus doing something, and then on the other side, I'll, I'll tell people to caption it, right? So I get you know, hundreds uh, of people you know, thinking on behalf of the octopus and kind of putting themselves in the arms, I guess, of an octopus. And um, it's really funny, our, our community is hilarious. Um, and I just wanted to read this. Um, the person captioned this. I think it's an octopus that's um, like grabbing on a crab, and the crab's like fighting with it. And uh, somebody captioned, that crab owes that octopus $40, and it's not like the octopus is broke or whatever, but the crab's been acting real weird ever since, like avoiding the octopus and trying to flex for the gram. And really, it's just a matter of principle at this point, right? <laughs> so we receive hundreds of comments of people reading each other's comments and playing along, and we feel like, you know, where you could be doom and gloom, like why not get people interested in starting to consider the octopus in a completely new way that allows them to just kind of humanize them with every single caption in this campaign that we do. So that's just one way that we kind of are thinking about animals as influencers. And Merlin, I remember you said uh, like you, you do like elevator pitch for bats. Tell me more about it. I specialize in amazing facts as attention getters for bats. <laughs> For example, did you know that bats save Texas farmers more than a billion dollars a summer in avoided pesticide use? Billion. <laughs> did you know that you might not have 
any more margaritas if it weren't for bats that pollinate the agaves from which tequila is made. <laughs> Did you know that bats can fly 100 miles an hour, travel thousands of feet up into the sky to intercept billions of invading moth pests every spring? Did you know that they have <laughs> social systems strikingly similar to those of higher primates? And on and on. Uh, just things that you know, if I sit beside somebody on a plane, I'll kind of size up what they might be interested in, and depending on what I think they would be interested in, I come up with one of these did you knows. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's perfect. And um, in many cases, conservation efforts kind of seem, pr seem to prioritize cute uh, and popular animals. Um, over the others, and we kind of have a challenging lineup of animals here. Octopus. <laughs> <laughs> octopus <laughs> are terrifying. Wait, that. The octopus yeah. are terrifying. Bugs are disgusting, and <laughs> bats are scary. <laughs> <laughs> and so, how do you um, that how how do you challenge people's preconceived notions? Um, and pe like these perceptions of these uh, that oh, these animals that are often stigmatized. Neither cuteness nor current popularity are reliable indicators of animal value. It stands <laughs> to reason it's obvious that if you don't know much about an animal, it can't be very popular. So. <laughs> Animals like bats are active at night, have a hard time being popular because people don't understand them. And the more people don't understand something, the more they fear it. But the truth is that if people knew all there was to know about, for example, bats, they'd probably love all of them regardless of which ones were cute or ugly. And ugly is all in the perception of the beholder. If you're an expert on sonar, for example, you might look at a bat that looks stranger than a dinosaur and say, oh, wow, you know, look at all that sophistication for sending out pulses or differentiating the waves coming back. Actually, the discoverer of bat echolocation speculated that bat sophistication in this area is more than a billion times ahead of anything humans have ever developed. So I make a big point of, as an ecologist, popularity is not an indicator of importance and cuteness is, isn't either. Uh, it's very wise to look at the fact that all animals interact and are interdependent. That's why biodiversity is important. If we protect just one favorite animal, we're missing the boat. We have to be concerned about the balance of nature. Thank you. Yeah, yeah so for me, I remember, um, again, the question I get all the time is, so, you know, what is your degree in? And so uh, I was a classical saxophone performance major. <laughs> I, and now I'm, uh, it, the whole AHC is like a superpower, right? So, and now I'm, you know, the founder of the largest octopus fan club. So I would go, I would buy academic research paper. This is what I did for fun. I'd buy academic research papers. I would read it and be like, I don't understand what this means, right? And I was like, how would I explain this to somebody in a way that like would get them interested? Or, or I always was thinking of like, how could I explain something to somebody in a way that they could immediately leave and say, you know what I learned today about the octopus? And so one of the things that I do is I break down individual behaviors of octopus. And I'm sure all of you have heard, wow, octopuses are aliens. They're like, un any, like unlike anything on this planet. And what I've learned by receiving you know, millions of comments on Octonation is that actually isn't that effective, is by treating them like different than us. And so what I do with Octonation is I really try to make them relatable to us, you know, like saying they're like a squishy puppy dog or, you know, um, an octopus on their suckers, uh, they can kind of give themselves manicures, right? And so every single sucker has this like chitinous cuticle on it. And they'll, um, if they want to learn how to like taste or if they want to taste better or improve their sense of taste, because they can taste with their suckers, 
um, they'll start like kind of like exfoliating their suckers and they'll be like these little lily pads like floating through the water column and it'll improve their sense of taste and their grip on objects, right? And so I feel really confident that when people leave, you'll be like, I learned today that you know, octopuses can give themselves manicures. Like, did you know that? And so you feel really empowered to start talking about them. And the other slide that you saw, the octopus poop, poop looks like shelly string. I got the great idea to go into a classroom and teach kids that octopuses poop looks like silly string, like it shoots out of their siphon, right? What I didn't know is that the younger the kids are, the more they think I'm like spraying octopus poop on them with silly string. And so I think I traumatized a kindergarten class one time, but they'll never forget that octopus poop looks like silly string. And then um, the last thing is, is panoramic cameras. Like, you know, if you look at the octopus's eye, um, they have these horizontal bar, you know? And so uh, what's really interesting is imagine like two panoramic cameras on your head. They can see nearly 360 degrees around their bodies. So you could never sneak up on an octopus, right? And so this is kind of the way I educate an octonation and all of this, you know, education and this ocean literacy is going viral on our accounts. Like we've been shared by Michael B. Jordan, Busta Rhymes, surprisingly enough, Dwight Howard of the Los Angeles Lakers. And they're all playing a role in educating uh, people at scale about this creature that I get has been on this planet since before dinosaurs. So we'll, we'll take questions so at the Robert, end. What's a siphon? A siphon is like, it's like almost like this tube-like thing that sticks out of its head. Um, and uh, it's where the octopus exhales. So they breathe in through their mantle cavities and they exhale through the siphon. So yeah, Thank you. for sure. Oh yeah, and so you know, building on the idea of um, how do you get people to relate with a non-human entity that might be considered creepy, when I'm trying to get people excited about Luna moths, usually what I lead with is the notion that they have these beautiful eye spots on their wings. So to drop some you know, deep time evolution facts for y'all, first of all, dinosaurs were last year in the Cretaceous era, mm -hmm. 65 million years ago. Uh, moths evolved about 300 million years ago. And within the insect fossil record, there's actually evidence of insects having eye spots on their wings, which is amazing, because if you think about when mammals evolved, those eye spots have been a static system of visual communication for at least 150 million years on this planet. Mm. So if you're someone like me that's interested in visual storytelling, <coughs> design thinking, you're trying to figure out what symbols actually mean something <coughs> to different people or different species or across 150 million years of time, it's mind blowing to think that that ocular symbol has remained a viable system of communication. So when I'm trying to get people in the arts who are all interested in history, visual history, usually I just drop that fact and I'm like, yeah, that's like, that, that, that's like design thinking at work. That's and, awesome. Uh, yeah, yeah. And also one last fun fact, um, and Merlin knows this, Luna moths and bats have been in an evolutionary arms race for at least 60 million years, and that's why Luna moths have those beautiful long tails. Those are strategic. They actually help break up the bat's ability to navigate in space and find them. So it's a tool. So these beautiful, these beautiful Luna moths, um, everything about them is strategic, which again, if you're thinking about strategic design theory, like look at bugs. Yeah. Yeah. And we're going to get more into art. So this uh, question is for you. Um, so in this animal influencer world, there are people from science, nonprofit orgs, and animal rights. So why artists? What makes art an effective tool for influencing changes in behavior around ecology? Yeah, so I think art is really good at stepping back and defamiliarize something and try to change our usual way of looking at this non-human species. Um, and uh, by, by doing that, you also cultivate a kind of curiosity. Like, without doing this mouse coach, with, my, with the mouse. I didn't know that they, do you know that they run a half marathon every day, even like that small size. So what I'm doing is I, I need to match them. I basically <laughs> need to <laughs> run a half marathon every day. <laughs> and do um, you know that um, the octopus have the distributed intelligence. Uh, they, each of their arm can think on its own. Um, and while male octopus trying to escape from being eaten, 
during mating with female octopus, they cut off an arm, and that arm can just swim on its own <laughs> to deposit their sperm. Um, <laughs> so like you, by co-creating with these species, you can tap into their intelligence, recognize this alternative intelligence, and shift perspectives, and in a way, try to interrogate ourselves, interrogate our way of this anthropocentric thinking. Nice. Yeah, I love that. And um, you know, again, it's like shifting your own thinking. If you think about how decisions, how behavior change is done, you know, the most effective way of really getting into someone is diving into the subconscious. Art is the language of the subconscious. How does the subconscious speak? Through symbols. So if you're looking at symbols as a way of getting into the subconscious, animals operate within that space. So again, look at the visual strategies, the design strategies that animals are doing to signal information to one another. And I mean, you're, you're getting into some like deep, deep primordial zeitgeist stuff. Nice, let's talk a little bit more about brands. Um, is anybody here in marketing, advertising? Nice, so this is for you. <laughs> oh, so why should brands um, care about using animal influencers in their storytelling? What opportunities do animal influencers offer and what potential ethical concerns should brands consider when working with animals? Mm, so I have a thought on this, and I'll keep it really short. Um, celebrities frequently are used to promote brands, but we all know that celebrities frequently get canceled. So I propose this idea, celebrities are fleeting, animals are timeless. If you're going to align your brand with a thing, align it with a thing that is an animal, help raise that awareness about the animal. And just to cite a few examples of popular brands that have animal figureheads. I, I know there's Puma. Does anyone else think of there one? Goes. Yeah! Uh, Penguin Books. Um, Smokey the Bear. Ooh, Smokey the Bear. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's dozens when you really think about it. And of course, it's like no, one, no one's going to cancel a penguin. No one's going to cancel Smokey. No one's going to cancel a Puma. So. No, that's animals. Yeah. So Merlin. <laughs> yeah, so what, yeah. how about for you? So what, uh, what opportunities do animal influencers offer and what potential ethical concerns should brands consider when working with animals? Well, there's a lot to cover there, but there's no better place to use animal influencers than right here in Austin. I love combos where corporations advertising of their products can make a dramatic difference to help the conservation of an animal and the animal, using the animal by the corporation helps sales as well. A perfect example of this is when I, early on when I was getting started back conservation, the president of Bacardi mounted a million dollar ad campaign around a brochure that they published, The Most Famous Bat. And this brochure was about, ostensibly about how they got their bat logo for Bacardi. But in reality, it was very cleverly done where they wove all kinds of really cool facts about bats into their brochure. And at that time, Bats were just, I mean, almost everybody knew that bats were all, most if not all rabid and dirty, filthy, ugly things that would attack you. And so it took a very brave corporation to step out and do a million dollar ad campaign for bats. But it worked beautifully. And I know people who still today, 20 some years later, when they go and look for, let's say, a rum and coke, they ask for Bacardi and coke awesome. because they remember how Bacardi stepped out and did something brave for conservation. Another instance where Bacardi used bats very productively, they found the most famous chef in Chicago and convinced him to host a dinner party where every single thing in the menu had something to do with bats. Wouldn't have, you know, it came from a bat plant or a, a nut that was bat seed dispersed, etc. And later, that chef reported that 
Never in his life had he ever gotten such far-flung and good PR from an event. It was, you know, stepping out and doing something a little bit unique that people don't expect. That's what you get big attention for, not just being like everybody else and doing the normal kind of advertising. And I love these kinds of stories, and I'd be delighted, and my staff, uh, Trace over here too, would love to talk to any of you who have ideas about how to uh, use bats. I think they're ideal influencers. Uh, they definitely catch attention that other animals don't. And so that's my comment on, on uh, brands. <laughs> and these are the brands that who have animals in their logos. So you're, if you're from any of these companies, here's your... <laughs> Um, so I'm working with Tencent, uh, the largest in internet company in China, and this is uh, to, to rebrand their uh, logo. And so this is the penguin, and it has, has been there for 25 years. It's even longer than the average age of a, peng a real penguin. So it's getting outdated, and they want to change. And it's a good opportunity to involve uh, so many like different species of penguin, what do they like, what's their behavior, to cultivate a curiosity among penguins. And also it's a good opportunity to talk about how the emperor penguin are being endangered, getting into the endangered zone uh, because of the ice melting and sea level rise in Antarctica. Because, um, and why, why this matters brand? This doesn't make money, but it's not true because conscious connection count and positive PR is priceless. Mm, I love that. So we have one final question for everyone, and that is, how can we create a balance between using animal influencers for raising awareness and not giving a false sense of security that everything is fine? What can we do to translate awareness into meaningful change? I got so busy watching the mic being handed back and forth, <laughs> I lost track. I can repeat uh, the question. Let, let me simply point out that people rarely help any animal that they don't understand. They tend to fear what they don't understand. And the more we educate people, the more progress we're going to make. I find that education is key, presented as here's what you can do to help. I don't tell anybody about a problem that they can't help solve. What good does it do to talk about something just scare people with gloom and doom if they can't do anything about it? I talk about things that you can make a difference, how you can make a difference, and I like to feature stories about people who have or are making a big difference in a surprising way. Something that influences, encourages, and motivates others to try to do something similar or even better. Yeah, that's a, a common oh, yeah. theme. Yeah, right? And I was just even thinking, like Bacardi paid you, or Bacardi paid the organization, you know, or did the million dollar campaign a long time ago, and you're still talking about it. So, I mean, it just goes to show you, and they didn't pay him. Bacardi didn't pay him, and yet here we are talking about Bacardi. Um, oh, sorry, I messed it up. <laughs> uh, you can you can uh, put it back on full screen if you want. Uh, but what I was going to say to answer that question is um, how do you create a balance? Um, and create meaningful change is I've always been of the firm belief and I think you know I was a highly sensitive kid and every single time people told me that you know an animal was getting hurt and I think that's why I shy away from animal rights um, and stuff like that only because it just shuts me down completely and I, I feel like the world's you know messed up 
Um, and so with Octonation, I'm really big on telling people, you know, anger really isn't a sustainable m emotion when it comes to combating climate fatigue. It's, it's really not. So the more you piss people off, um, it's, it doesn't really evoke curiosity and people don't really understand um, the, the literacy behind it. And so with Octonation, stuff that we've done is just we're creating things that haven't been created yet. Like I said, the first ever comprehensive field guide of octopus species on our website. Um, we launched this past year the first ever international octopus photography competition that no, none had ever been done before. Um, and also, when I think of the impact of Octonation, we get so many stories every single day. Uh, a father reached out to me and he said, hey, I just want to let you know that when I come home from work, me and my daughter watch Octonation every single night. And um, I, I also wanted to let you know that we were at a fast food restaurant the other day and she asked me, where do I throw it away so that I don't hurt the octopus, right? And so I didn't, I didn't have to scare her. I, I, I simply had to educate her through Octonation and she's making sustainable decisions and she's becoming more conscious as a result of having that baseline literacy about an animal that she loves. So I think that's the power of really getting people and inspiring that wonder is they know what they're fighting for. Uh, and if they don't know what they're fighting for, then, then that's just that. They, they'll just be angry about random stuff that they can't really voice. Or. Yeah, and I think um, there are three different levels that there's actions can, can happen. Personal level, institution level, and government level. Personal level, raising awareness, education, um, or even like build bad houses. Merlin has a new book coming out, already come out, uh, on how to build bad, the best bad houses, what works, what doesn't, many years of experience. And on institutional level, um, you can donate, you can uh, contribute to these in, uh, institutions that work in the area, and um, you can, the, if, for the branding company, you can change your branding that um, inspire this curiosity. Uh, and positive message. And then government level, we can vote. Um, there are certain policies, for example, in Alaska, in this uh, uh, re natural reserve, they want to extract oil there, and that will get a lot of uh, animals be in danger, but they vote it down. So um, that's, that's where you can do at the government level. Did you want to say something, Marilyn? I never did anything that had more impact than introducing bad houses to America. At the time that I introduced bad houses, virtually everybody knew that all bats were rabid, that they were vicious, they especially picked on children and pets. Uh, <laughs> everything you could think of that was bad was ascribed to bats. I came back with the idea of bat houses and it caught on and it made thousands of people ambassadors for bats because once they had bats in a bat house, the neighbors, you know, would, oh my God, aren't you afraid you're gonna get rabies? Mm -hmm. No, no one has ever gotten rabies from a bat coming to a bat house in somebody's yard. Uh, in fact, it's exceedingly rare for anybody to get any disease from a bat and you don't have even a risk if you don't try to handle them. Bill Garrett, when he was still president of National Geographic, had a bat house in his backyard, and when he'd entertain friends, they would sit out on the back porch and bet on the time in which the bats would first emerge. But bat houses have really caught on, and now there are more than 30 vendors on Amazon, and they're just a wonderful way where people can actually make a profit out of educating people something that's really important that we'd have to spend money to do otherwise and yet we have all this progress made uh, hundreds of thousands of bats in America now live in bat houses and even more important they're educating lots and lots of people nice beautiful I just had one final thing I wanted to say and I thought this slogan was really clever when I came up with it. So, you know, hold your grounds. But I really do believe in the power of symbolism and the power of positive symbolism. Because again, when people are psychologically shut down, you cannot access any type of information dialogue. So like live in the joy, live in the hope. And that made me think of the phrase, don't quiet quit 
on planet Earth. <laughs> <laughs> Before we get into some Q&A, um, you know, it, we, we were talking when we were workshopping and, and we met up before this and talking about this concept of like, because um, I mentioned to you, Austin brings like close over $10 million in, uh, in, in revenue in tourism for the bats, probably a lot more than that now. I mean, after this, if you want to join us, we actually have a meetup that we're doing and you can see the bats with the reason why they're still alive under Bath Congress Bridge. So if you want to follow us, we're going to have that available after this. Um, but just things like, you know, if, if you are inspired by Merlin and what he's done for the city of Austin, you know, uh, a way in which you could consider, you know, helping is they came up with this concept of like, um, like a certified bat business or something. And uh, imagine like the businesses that are positively impacted by the bats donating a percentage, you know, or something like that. If that feels, if that, if you're in marketing, you're in Austin, if you want to do a marketing campaign with bats or anything like that, um, his organization is available to consult and really put in a good word for you and, and make that happen. Um, and so uh, we'll move on to Q and A. Um, how does this work? Do I just run to people or? <laughs> Oh, I see it right there. Oh, there's a mic right here. Cool. <laughs> so if, if you'd like to ask any of us questions, um, you can walk up to the mic and uh, we'd love to answer them. Hi, everyone. My name is Brianna. I'm based here in Austin. I have a sustainable bath town line. And I was running on the trail the other day, just doing my thing. And I see a guy walking towards me. And I'm like, cute. Is that like a cattail? Is that a raccoon? Like, what's on his shoulder? And it was just this big snake, like, wrapped around his head. <laughs> and I just, like, screamed so loud. And I took mm. off. And I, like, hated it because I am so afraid. And mm. I don't want to be. So is there an influencer for snakes? Like, how do we stigmatize <laughs> snakes? Because I need that for me. <laughs> I mean, I personally don't know one. But I do believe in, like, the beauty of, of diversity of love. And there's probably that snake in I mean, Brittany, I feel like Brittany, when she took the yeah. stage, yeah, she probably did a true. lot for snakes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I actually, I want to tag on to that because my dad raised Burmese pythons. So I was raised with 300 plus Burmese pythons. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's my fun fact. When you go in a circle, it's like, <laughs> oh, I'm a snake girl. Like, that was nice. my title in school. So there isn't a big, like, culture for that. So it's interesting you say that, but I've battled that for a long time. Of like, how do you rewrite this narrative? Because if you think about it, Disney villainizes snakes. There's a lot of old like literature that villainizes snakes. So that'd be interesting. I don't have an answer, but I have battled that like, how do you make snakes like not as scary? Mm. So, yeah. and I have a student uh, working with spiders, and he's super Ooh. afraid of spiders. Whoa. But through cooperating with spider, he kind of conquered that fear over time, and gaining new perspectives. Ooh, and an idea. You know, again, I'm someone that loves symbolism and mythology. I mean, there's a lot of really beautiful indigenous tales that uplift the snake. Mm -hmm. um, I, I just came back from a trip to Mexico City, and I was at the beautiful Anthropology Museum, and the snake god is a venerated figure. So there is a cultural history of, of appreciation for an animal that you know contemporarily in Western culture might be vilified. So there's hope, you know? There's hope. I love that. I came up for a totally different question, but I love this conversation. We're here to help. We're here to help. Hey, collaboration. So, yeah. well, this is a little less positive, but I wonder if this has happened, this has come up, or maybe something to think through. Mm -hmm. So we talk about animals as influencers, and nobody really owns a specific animal, right? Mm -hmm. So anybody can brand it. So what if somebody pulls a bat on their brand, but it's totally unethical, they don't like what they're doing, they're spreading misinformation or whatever, who checks them? Like, who keeps that in check? Is there a society? Like, what? how does that work? I'm usually one of the first to hear about such things. <laughs> and and it, can, it can be a real pain for me because I don't like writing or calling people and telling them that they're doing something bad that they ought to, you know, that's, I would rather motivate people into positive action. But, uh, there are suppliers of bat skeletons and 
And some of these things actually become more popular as I make bats more popular. And it's difficult sometimes to draw the line between I love bats so I want a bat skeleton and uh, you shouldn't have a bat skeleton. Mm. Uh, back to your snakes. I was into snakes before bats. Oh, <laughs> and what happened? My poor mother had to suffer from me dragging seven foot snakes into the house and having them get loose and scare the heck out of her friends when they came to visit. Yep. But, uh, you know, snakes and bats have a lot in common. It's fear of the unknown. You know, there's not a snake in Texas that's going to attack anybody. There's not a bat in Texas that's going to attack anybody. And as soon as people understand that the only way they can get in trouble with these animals is to actually go out of their way to grab the animal. You know, most people bitten by rattlesnakes are catching rattlesnakes during rattlesnake roundup. They're not innocent people who just happen to have a rattlesnake chase them down. And so getting, combating fear is key. There's a paper recently published after COVID came out in China talking about how they tested students at a university with a program about the positive reasons why bats are important and what they do for people. And then another one about why you shouldn't have to fear disease from bats. And the one extolling the values of bats had very little impact in making more of the students want to save them. But the one pointing out that bats, you didn't have to worry about that disease transmission from bats was incredibly rare. That one moved the needle in favor of people wanting to conserve bats. So sometimes we go out and we say snakes are really valuable, bats are really valuable, and we don't realize that if we don't deal with the fear factor, we haven't really moved the needle very far. Yeah, we've, uh, I would say Optination has gotten to the point where we're so big now that people tag us in almost every single story. I always tell people if somebody whispers octopus, like our team's going to hear it. <laughs> um, because there's uh, lots of things that happen and that happen on social media. Now that, um, you know, there's certain platforms that drive vanity, you have people that will rip an octopus out of its den, um, attach it to its body, and they'll be like, oh, the octopus wants to be on the body. I'm like, no, that's a a self-defense mechanism, it's clinging so that you can't eat its arms. So, you know, you have to like educate and figure out where these stories taking place and then just educate people where they're at. But there's been lots of stories where like octopuses are, are underwater bullies and stuff like that. New York Times says things like that. Um, but we, we've, gotten to the, we've gotten so big now and we have so many celebrity followers that we can pretty much activate and kind of correct the misinformation that's happening. I really feel like time's up for these brands that are utilizing these animals and uh, not donating to a cause. Like that's why I think with, with Merlin, if Austin's Bat City, then what commitment to these businesses that benefit from the migration every night, what are they doing? You know, and it, it's only a matter of time before local people here in Austin are just like, hey, this isn't actually cool. Are you a bat approved city? Are you donating to Merlin or any of the organizations? Um, and so we can, the people in this room can be responsible for Austin kind of waking up to that and being like, okay, are you a bad approved business? But wait until we launch that, so. Yeah. Thank you very much. I didn't pay him to say that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a hype guy, not just for Octopus, but I see the value. I mean, Merlin's iconic. Like, he's an Austin rock star here. So I really feel like um, you need a hype man. I'm ready to be that for you. And, 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 and being a broad-minded biologist, I love her Luna Maws. I used to raise them when I was a kid. Woo! And I and love octopuses. <laughs> One of my first early family pictures that I used to love was a picture of my father with a huge octopus that he caught in Hawaii. And I've always loved all these things. And I'm so happy to be a part of changing the world's attitudes, not just about bats, but about the need to conserve all living things because they're all interdependent. Mm. As soon as we start showing big time favoritism for one, we're harming others. Yeah, nice, more questions? One last question and then I'm done. Okay. Um, <laughs> question for you. Do you have lunar moth pets and what are their names? <laughs> oh, Very important. Oh, 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 
I love them. I, I, I don't typically name them. Um, I'll keep this really short, but Luna moths, when they hatch, they only live for a few days. So, so you can walk away from today knowing this. When Luna moths emerge as adults, they do not have any mouth parts. They do, do not have a digestion tract. They do not have an anus. So when they come out of their cocoon, metaphorically, they only have one tank of gas. So that's why they only live a few days. Wow. So they emerge purely for the objective to find their community, sync up, lay some eggs, maybe fly a few miles, drop some eggs there, and that's it. So they're very efficient with their drive. So that being said, um, I don't tend to name them just because I don't know how long they'll be on Earth with me, but I love them all. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Hi, my name is Vanessa, and I work for the Environmental Defense Fund. Um, so I write a lot about climate change, which there's a lot of doom and gloom in that. But we're trying to focus more on our storytelling on the solutions, you know, presenting the problem, but then here's what you can actually do about it. And I'm just curious, I, especially for ActoNation, you have such a big following now. Have you used that to kind of activate any policy change or get people involved in like ocean conservation or is there like a way that you see of like, we've got all these people who care about octopus now, octopi, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> yeah. and how do you use that for an action that might yeah. help So what, how kind of I see our role is where it, our, mission is to inspire wonder of the ocean by educating the world about octopuses. And our vision is to be a global leader in wildlife education, research, and conservation. So when people come to Octonation, it's typically to do a strategic collaboration or partnership in which I work with them to develop a campaign to achieve, to achieve something. Um, like, you know, Upward, the, you know, came to us, we've done a campaign with them, we've done campaigns with the Explorers Club of New York, we've done campaigns, uh, we were working on one with um, United Nations, like a United Nations of octopuses. So you can, you know, be really effective, um, but it's kind of coming to us, it, it's me, I have a creative director who's in, phenomenal, um, our scientific advisor is Dr. Chelsea Bennis, she's known as the Octo Girl, she's in Florida. Um, I have a team of science writers that are all PhD, cephalopod, um, you know, uh, enthusiasts and, and incredible people. And when people work with Octonation, we, like I said, we have this team of people that can develop a really eff effective campaign to achieve an action. Um, obviously, the one, one of the biggest ones right now is octopus farming. And as, because we're not an animal rights organization, it still doesn't mean that we can't partner with one and, and have them at least have the correct information uh, so that when they're educating at scale for a reason why we wouldn't want these or you know, why we would want these, at least they're, they're being factual and they're establishing this literacy. So that's kind of how I do it. It's just my purpose is, like I said, to inspire wonder and educate and I stay in that lane because I feel like there's enough work to be done there. And that's what people need the most help on right now. Hi, my name is Taylor. I'm a social media manager for San Diego Zoo Wildlife Alliance. Mm -hmm. um, and I actually worked with you super briefly when I was at Georgia Aquarium. Oh, nice. Oh, yeah, I remember the yeah. uh, virtual oct or the octopus encounter. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That was fun. Uh, so I guess my problem is very similar, is that we're trying to educate folks about these animals that often aren't loved. Mm -hmm. um, but then once we do get them hooked, they want to make them pets almost immediately. Mm -hmm. And so then we deal with the illegal wildlife trade at the same time <laughs> that we're trying to get people interested in saving them in their natural habitat, which kind of like goes against each other. So I don't know if you have any advice for how you kind of get people interested without talking, or like without them thinking they can have this animal, they can possess it. So I have just a quick thought just from my, you know, visual storytelling background. I think if I was trying to communicate reverence for that, that creature, I would build in the, the importance of context inside its environment. So, you, you basically focus the love not just on the creature as like a thing floating in space, like a floating signifier, if you will, but have it semiotically contextualized by whatever it is. So I, I don't know why this camp comes to mind, but if you're trying to promote like a, a clownfish, like every image have the clownfish embedded inside that sea anemone, so that way people's take home is like, oh, I, I'm not an ocean, I'm not a sea anemone provider, so I can't adequately care for the clownfish, so it behooves me, because I love this thing, to want to give it the love that it deserves and to be in the environment that it deserves. That's what I would do if I was drawing for you right now in a session. Yeah. Merlin, do you have any? 
we have had plenty of problems with people wanting to keep pet bats. And we go about that by pointing out that like insect eating bats can, you know, one bat can catch a thousand insects in an hour and uh, they're highly intelligent animals that live sometimes for more than 40 years, even tiny ones. Uh, they have long-term friendships, social order similar to higher primates. Uh, this is not a trivial thing, taking a bat out of the wild and putting it in a small container at home and expecting it to be happy and healthy. Mm -hmm. And so we go at this more from a, it's great that you love bats, but build a bat, put a bat house in your yard or something so that you can have fun enjoying watching bats, but don't try to keep one in your house. First of all, any bat that you can catch for a pet is more likely than any other one to be sick. The very fact that you can find and catch a bat says that it may very well be sick. Most of them aren't sick with rabies, but you don't want to take a chance. And so we balance it that way and have done pretty well, but basically the ones that are really determined to have bat pets become bat rehabbers so they can officially have permission to do it from the state. And that, that's not so bad. At least those people are well edu edified on the subject and uh, are much less likely to get into trouble. And um, the country Costa Rica is doing really well in this field. There are so many laws and regulations of different animals can be pets. I work with this uh, wildlife uh, animal rescue center called Rescate, and they uh, rehab a lot of the animals that are being confiscated that were pet before, and it blows your mind what kind of animals people bring for pets, like they're crocodiles, they're uh, puma, and <laughs> they grow up bigger and they realize they're not a good idea for pets. And they also have this campaign called uh, hashtag no selfie with animals, because a lot of people get these animals for pets and take selfie with them and then discard them afterwards. Yeah. I should point out there's two sides to this coin. If you take a look, the most famous, most accomplished wildlife conservationists in American history all started out as, for example, hunters that most people who love wildlife today would be horrified at. And many of these people, I myself, I have had a pet of almost everything conceivable. I was a falconer. I even tried to rob an eagle's nest one time to get an eaglet to train for falconry. <laughs> I've had giant otters as pets. I've had giant eiders as pets. I've had prehensile-tailed porcupines as pets. You name it. But it's p young people who have this exposure in, and learn about animals firsthand who often later become the most ardent conservationists. Roosevelt bragged one time about how he killed, I think it was 10 or 11 grizzly bears for no good reason than his pride in a week. And yet he ended up doing marvelous things for preserving wildlife. So I'm very nervous about now we have so much regulation that Kids can't do the things that we did when we were young that led to our being ardent preservationists. And that's a little scary. Hmm. Last question. Uh, yeah, hi. My, my name is Georg. I'm from Germany, and I bring gaming companies together with uh, forest conservation projects. Mm -hmm. We show all the engagement in a digital twin. It's called the Games Forest Club. Mm -hmm. And um, so, we have now 50 companies, over 50 companies, who are supporting uh, 17 uh, forest projects around the globe. So if you would have to pick one animal which could stand for all the forests around the globe, which one would it be? The forests? Forests. <laughs> oh, that's so hard, because cause intuitively I'm like, oh, choose a yeti. <laughs> you know? but, um, but if you were to do that, because yetis are mythological creatures, you would not then be promoting the welfare of an actual creature that lives in a forest. So I wanted to cite that as an example of like, I would probably not choose something like a fairy or an elf or a yeti. Ants? But instead, what do you guys think? 
I'm good with the ocean. Octopus for the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, they're like little Pokemon, like of the sea. I mean, they have a unique superpower depending on where they live in the ocean. I was telling um, them that just like there's an Antarctic octopus that has antifreeze proteins in its skin. Amazing. There's a hot water volcano octopus that lives next to like 200 degree hydrothermal vents. You know, uh, so it, the more and more you start learning about them, the more and more you're just like, how is this the first time I've ever heard about something like this? Mm -hmm. Which is why I was really surprised that a lot of these resources didn't exist before a classical saxophone performance major came along. <laughs> I would like to point out how important people like Warren and Virginia can be who basically have no background, no authority to be experts in what they do, <laughs> and yet, are be doing a better job than most of us supposed experts. Don't underestimate uh, artists. <laughs> you know, I have a PhD with honors in bat biology, and yet I have a person from the UK who comes over and leads most of our field workshops, train workshops, and he knows more about the critical things that are important to conserving bats than any of my PhD level colleagues. And people like Daniel in the UK, Warren here, Virginia, they're self-taught in areas sometimes of great importance to the future, whereas the PhDs and others, they get a degree in some very esoteric small aspect of what they're studying, and they don't really make the difference that volunteerism from people who really care and learn on their own are able to make. Mm, thank you. Thank you. And then also just to think of an animal for you, I, I probably would lead with a songbird just because I do think birds have this direct relationship with a tree. And I'm just thinking in your brand, even if it is a songbird, you could have like a little branch in the image leading to a tree. And then also forests are so diverse around the world but birds seem to be pretty consistently found within forests. So that would be my, my suggestion to you. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. And I'll last to wrap up, and I think we need to get out of here. Yeah, we need to get out. Uh, I'll pick Thank mycelium. You. They are in charge of uh, the forest, the trees communicating to each other. Uh, and if you're picking like the whole forest, that's them. Mycelium? Yeah, they talk to each other through, oh, wow. the trees talk so to each other through. So mushroom, country. bird. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, or bat. Yeah, bats, bats, bats. So again, um, you can come, you can chat with us. Um, I'm, if you scan this QR code, you can win a jumbo octopus. Um, and um, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, I hope this you inspired so you. And if you want to come um, with us, what time does it start? We're going to walk over at 6 around this uh, time frame, and you can see um, the bats with Merlin and ask him more questions about the bats while he's there. Yeah, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.